with you guys. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you very much uh, for such a uh, warm welcome, although not, not everything is true. And um, thank you, Manuela, for you, know, you both inviting me for being here. A uh, couple friends and, and colleagues here have asked me, Claudio, why police? I mean, how come? I mean, you, you've been working. What happened? Right? And um, so I plan to tell you a little bit about that in a second. But, and then also uh, maybe to, to talk a little bit of, about what is police psychology field. I just figured out that not um, too many of us are aware of this field in psychology called police psychology. So I said, you know what, let me tell you about, a little bit about it. Um, and um, then I select a, just like three, maybe three studies that I'm gonna go through really won't take too long. I mean, I don't want to bother you to death with, we know, with uh, numbers. But I wanted to give you the general idea of what it is. And then, yes, to the main, my main points, why? Why studying this? So I'll be able to answer some of the questions. Now, uh, some of the questions regarding, you know, why police? Uh, that uh, I was asked. Uh, in a per more personal note, um, well, as Anka said, I am a social psychologist. As well, I have a degree. I have a degree in social. Okay, my degree is in I/O social psychology. So it's pretty much, you know, both sides. Uh, as you know, they are really close um, uh, areas. I mean, they are quite, you know, uh, uh, friends. You know, social psychologists and I/O psychologists. So. Uh, I use a lot of social psychology in organizations. And a few years back, I'm from Brasilia, as you can see, the University of Brasilia. Brazil is the capital of the country, and where there are some very unique aspects um, in this city, because that's pretty much where the government is. And more than that, that's where the main protests, where the main uh, political stuff happened in the, in the country. That's where people go to the streets. You probably have seen some scenes very embarrassing for Brazilians, but for some scenes that, you know, when the Congress was, Brazilian Congress was invaded, um, and these sort of things, all those things happen in Brasilia. Well, these were embarrassing, but a few years back, about uh, 80, at 80, 84, at, um, there were also beautiful scenes, for those of you who don't remember, were not alive then, um, about the, Brazil, the Brazilians go to the streets asking for uh, direct vote, you know, presidential vote, because we were in a dictatorship, so that all those movements happened in Brazil, in Brasilia. And uh, so it's a very unique aspect about that city, you know, because of that. And um, so when, here I am, I was there in my university doing, minding my own business, and then the police uh, uh, approached me, not in this sense, but, uh, I mean, they had done this before. But the police approached me and said, you know what, we have some problems there, and uh, uh, we heard about you. Why don't you come and give us a hand? I went there, gave them a hand, and that started a big partnership uh, because I figured out in that uh, first experience that I had with them that it was a very good, here's my point, and that's the point I'm trying to present here. They are a very interesting organization and uh, environment for us to work at. They are comparable, which is great. There are some differences between police in, uh, in, in the world, right? But they have a key main aspects that go through all of them that have to do with their organizational culture. They are compl completely co comparable. Uh, as you see, uh, some features uh, are there when you talk or when you investigate the police in Brazil. When you do so um, in, uh, in Europe, in England, or when you do so in France, or in the US, there are some unique aspects that's always there. And that, that one makes them comparable. So I, I was very happy to be approached by them and get to know them. And um, then, after a little while, um, when I talk with Anka, we briefly discuss. Uh, Anka has a beautiful work guys, you should take a look at it, and she should make it more available for us. But a beautiful work with sex workers and the police in Ireland, the Guardia, am I co pronouncing co correct? Guardia? Guardi? 
uh, pardon my, uh, I don't speak Gaelic, so <laughs> anyway. Um, she has a beautiful work on that, and then she knows what I'm talking about when I said, well, when you look at the police, there are interesting things for us to see. So before, uh, I keep on going about talking about my studies, as I said, we developed Brazil, I thought it would be a good idea to let you know formally what is police psychology. It's also known as poli police and public, secu public security, public safety psychology, that's uh, one of their names. And um, it um, has been defined, and um, but that's pretty much probably the definition that you hear more, uh, as a field of, or a sub-discipline uh, sub of, of forensic psychology, but we, a one that has to do with the um, research, where is it? The research, hmm. yeah, the research and application of psychological principles and clinical skills for the law enforcement and public security people, you know, our field. And um, when I first got in touch with it, I decided to, you know, maybe it's a good idea to know what that happened, what happened here. Uh, how did that evolve into a, a discipline itself? And uh, let me tell you a story that starts back in the 60s. In the 60s, in the US, police was called uh, psycho sorry, psychologists were called into the police to work with test administration mainly. These were personal selection um, needs that they had. That's a field within the police that is still very psychology oriented. So pretty much every police um, uh, works with psychologists, have psychologists within their um, organization as, you know, working for their organization full time uh, as people who will work with tests, and we work with personal selection. But it's not only that. That back, worked back in the 60s, right? And um, by uh, the, here is it, by the 70s, uh, the police force, uh, different police force, uh, now I'm referring more to the US and the UK, um, noticed, let's put it this way, or start uh, using psychologists, or use the psychologist services to deal with crisis interventions in general, uh, of and how that resulted within the police officers. But I'm talking about PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, with police officers. Very common uh, um, issue with police officers. Suicide, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. So they said, you know what? We need help. We need help individually with those individuals here, because. Um, this is not healthy. What's going on? This is definitely a not healthy environment. We need you. Please help us. So this, that's when psychologists start working. Those things build upon, okay? What, I'm, what I mean, it's not like psychologists, oh, I won't do tests anymore. Just, no, those things keep on building on, right? So uh, that's when psychologists were approached and start getting the organization for that uh, uh, reason. And then in the 80s, um, they start noticing that uh, that be, could be uh, organized and delivered by psychology specific trainings for, psycho for police officers that were needed, especially in crisis interventions, shooting, how to negotiate with uh, um, uh, offenders when uh, there, is a, there are hosts involved, there are people being held there. Um, so I said, you know, we need those, this kind of uh, uh, um, training, you know, for the officers as well. So they decided to, to uh, call upon uh, police officers. And uh, in this context, that's when a large scale, in a large scale, police training, police officers training start uh, happening within the police um, now we are talking about Europe, uh, lots, some countries in Europe, US always, uh, and even in South America. That's when uh, these sort of trainings start happening, uh, more directed towards organizational development, especially, and management uh, development. So uh, from, from that perspective of, you know, crime things, you know, they started noticing that we could also use police uh, uh, psychologists 
to deal, to deal with I.O., uh, inter, um, industrial organizational psychology within the police. In fact, uh, in 86, and I see myself, I don't want to say the, the wrong date, yes. Uh, in 86, the International Association of Chiefs of Police uh, decided to make a division called Psychological Services Division within the police. That's something that when it was done by this association, it sends out message to the world, which was actually bought by the other police institutions, that well, you need uh, psychologists within the police, uh, working with psychological services in general. That will go from test administration to management training. So that's pretty much what happened back then in the 80s. Was on, and then we start working with the police. And it was only in 2013 that APA formally recognized police psychology as a professional speciality for psychologists. So there is actually uh, groups within the APA that discuss these sort of things we, talk, we are talking now. So that's something that became very uh, acceptable for you know, the American uh, Psychological Association, right? All right, and uh, I dare to divide. Um, I have to make some categorizations, guys. I mean, come on, I have to bring them something, you know? <laughs> so one way would be to categorize the main activities that psychologists um, engage in uh, when uh, working with the police. I divided them into individual services, program support, operation, and operational support. When we talk about well-being programs in general and um, stress management, we, they are really focus, focusing on the individual as meaning police, read, politi police officers. They are focusing on those folks, on those, on those people. Program, su program support, well, v v different types of organizational um, level interventions that psychologists work with. Probably the most noticeable one are management training I mean, development, but it's not only, but so different kinds of, uh, of ways that we work in the organizational level. And uh, operational support when you talk about criminal profiling, uh, when you talk about violence reduction, well maybe some of you here who are also a big fan of Law and Order, I love that, that show. So you've seen psychologists advising Olivia Benson, you know? So that's pretty much another what we call operational uh, support that is given by, the, by psychologists as well as uh, assisting in some uh, crisis moments, you know, like terrorist attacks or uh, when there are hosts involved, you know, that's um, what they do. So, here's what I thought. I want to tell you about three or, yeah, very briefly about three, just give you some information that we can discuss afterwards, of three or four studies that we've been developing um, in those fields that I marked in blue, right? So just to give a sample, that's all, uh, of studies that have been done in the field. So, uh, we working with risk perception, fear of crime, we talked a little bit after um, this session here. Tiago, we have a, a session especially with fear of, of crime that I suggest you to attend. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, uh, during COVID and, po and post-COVID interventions. Well, here there are different kind of uh, uh, dependent variables that we work with, you'll see. Uh, at the top, at the bottom, I just given you, I always will give you the reference, uh, but the main points here are, one of the studies that I picked, I just picked and choose, not randomly, but trying to confirm my, my categorization. I mean, somebody had to confirm that categorization. So, uh, in trying to confirm that, um, that will fall into, into the what I, what's the, the most operational part when it comes to violence, violence reduction and criminal profiling. Uh, we noticed that there was not a measure, uh, there was no way to assess risk perception for police officers. 
Um, if somebody here is interested in risk uh, evaluation, risk perception uh, literature, you will know that most of this literature uh, has been created, devoted, and um, investigated and discussed with the military and especially with aviation, especially with uh, officers that you know fly those very expensive planes. So that's pretty much what we have in our field when it comes to risk perception. Nothing on the beliefs. And then uh, we started looking at it and said, well, well, first of all, we need a measure for the police, right? They need to, we need to know how to assess that. So we developed this measure, and then, but then, that's the most interesting part, we wanted to know how that would relate to values when it comes to police officers and the civilians. So here's the definition only for those um, who are not so familiar with the field or the, the, the variable. Uh, risk perception is a judgment that people make, that we make, about the subjective probability of something dangerous happening. So how do I assess this, right? So um, in, uh, we did a series of studies with that, but the one I pick, uh, we went ahead and looked at uh, police officers in Brazil and civilians in Brazil. Well, okay, we got a good measure. I'm not getting into that. Just trust me, it was an interesting measure. But here's the things that are interesting. And uh, you see a pattern here. Uh, I'm assuming that most of us are familiar with the theory of values by, uh, proposed by Shalom Schwartz. Uh, so we see positive predictions and, and associations when it comes to conservation and uh, when it comes to self uh, transcendence and risk perception, but you will see that happening with all the variables as well. Uh, the more those folks, and now I'm talking about uh, uh, talking across samples, okay? Not only police officers, but also civilians. The more that both the people endorse um, the tradition, they endorse the norms, you know? A norm is there, a social norm is there to be used. So to be followed. I like that. So the more people are um, endorsing those things and, uh, or those values or having these motivations as the theory described, and the more people uh, endorse uh, taking care of the in-group, that's benevolence, um, be open and uh, welcoming of differences, of you know, different groups, um, of well-being of the people in general, or well-being of those who are close to you. That's called uh, self-transcendence. So the more people endorse that, the more they are ooh, aware of uh, risk for risk perception. And um, as you might remember, conservation high-order values are next door to self-transcendence higher order values, uh, which are opposite of openness to change, meaning those who endorse um, the new stimulation, right? Something that we don't know, I don't know, I like that, right? So those folks really don't do well when it comes to risk perception. Um, we're gonna discuss those things later, but we thought that uh, uh, Self-enhancement will be the same, um, but our studies, not only this one, but our studies proved us otherwise. Uh, we, we really could not find a link there, but we could find with openness to change. Um, I will discuss all those studies together in a little bit, but if we go a little bit more in detail on those relationships that I just pointed out, uh, for police officers, some values that relate to conservation are those who had stronger influence. And uh, for, by, by conservation, I mean um, security, uh, uh, being motivated to take care of the security of the, the group of you guys and of myself. <coughs> sorry. sorry. 
and of myself. These are called uh, social and personal security values. So those values and uh, the values of uh, uh, to, to conform with the rules that were sent out or laid down for the, the how we connect with people, how we interact with people, that's called uh, conformity, interpersonal conformity. Also in tradition, which value the tradition. Police officers, first of all, are very high on this, and those things relate quite well to risk perception. Civilians, on the other hand, uh, they, uh, re their values that relate more, or that were highlighted for us, that had higher correlations and higher uh, loadings, uh, were those that relate to self-transcendence, that I explained before. So when those folks um, have a concern for uh, they, they are people in general, for their group, and they feel they, that the group, they are in group, depend on them, trust them, like them. And uh, also, they like to uh, uh, endorse the nature in general, which was not there. This is called uh, universalism nature, universalism concern, and uh, benevolence dependability. Well, they, they co-correlate quite well with uh, risk perception. A negative correlation goes on for those folks who don't, who don't like to be told how to act. That's um, a, a self-direction uh, of thought and self-direction of action. Uh, those, those values correlate negatively with self-perception. Hold your thoughts. We're going to discuss this in a little bit, right? Um, then we said, wow, what is happening there? I mean, what's, what's going on, right? We made our own interpretations, but we wanted to know more. And then soon we found, soon, soon we found in literature there was not psychological literature for our surprise that, uh, that uh, a lot of people have been talking about um, those, um, not with the values, describing the values so clearly, but talking about how those perceptions have to do well, not only the perception of risk, but also their well-being, the way they relate to others that are close to them. I mean, they, by they I mean police officers. That's when we reach the concept that might, some of you might know, which is called work-family conflict, uh, when uh, it's hard for somebody to separate the stressors that are in their family from the stressors that are in the work. They bring work back home, and they bring their personal issues at work. You know, I mean, that, so pretty much work conflict uh, is when you do have the, the problems at work that all of us have and bring it to your family, right? So uh, very serious issue when it comes to police officers. Very serious, very common. Um, we hear a lot of reports about it. We, you can read a lot of work being done about that. And now uh, we said, okay, why don't we tailor down just police, right? Let's do a meta-analysis. And then we found only, I say only, because for me I thought I was expecting more, <clears throat> only 39 articles in different parts of the world describing this phenomenon within the police that lead us to 52 comparisons. Here are the countries, 16 countries, Brazil included. But when you look at that, in the map, you see where the, most of those studies came from, and uh, obviously the U.S. was uh, what, I, what we expected, where, was where we, they, they had more studies about work, uh, family conflict in the police force with police officers, right? Uh, general findings for, uh, that we got from um, these studies by other uh, colleagues. Well, first of all, that the nature of the police con uh, of the police force is one that is comp lays out the path for work-family conflict. It's just expected. That's what they are saying. You, you should look at it. You should find it. You know, when, when you look at it, you should find it. Work conflict within the police. They have such a uh, 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 
characteristic of their work that, is, that involves stress the whole time and that will lead to that conflict almost like by prediction, something that you should always deal with. So they, uh, they, they said, well, this is one thing that you should look at. Um, it's not a good thing, this conflict, as we know, but uh, the more you have work stressors, the more this conflict uh, happens, but when you make some investments in social support, that seems to decrease. So maybe it's a good idea to work with social support with those folks, right? And um, what uh, we said, that what we also said is that there is a, because of the dates, uh, there is not that, because of the dates of the, the articles that we found, it's an increasing interest in working with police officers and at least work conflict um, situations or events with police officers. So there seems to be um, something that has been attracting a lot of the attention of scholars when it comes to this field. So I said, wow, that's interesting. Uh, good, good results that we've got. Let's see then, of, 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 uh, let's talk about all the stressors. So why is it so stressful this profession? What's going on? Uh, so why don't we look at stress management and well-being? Uh, and that's when we started, started to uh, uh, develop a series of studies um, where we looked the effect of uh, uh, the way people appraise stressors, work-related stressors. That's called uh, the appraisal made by the, those folks. Are they, they, uh, the theory suggests that they either uh, appraise or eval evaluate the stressor as something that is more, that is a, a hindrance, something that is negative, not good to have uh, a stressor here, or that this stressor is a challenge that, well, can be overcome. Here I go. Um, and now, so we look at um, meaning in life as a possible moderator for this relationship. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, there was a session, I don't know who of you uh, were here, that was organized and chaired by Sharon Glazer. I don't know where, there she is. And I don't dare to define better what meaningful life in life is after her, her presentation and um, the, the presentation of other colleagues in that session, nor would I dare to explain what the, the appraisal, the stress or appraisal that is made, but in general, that's the idea, okay? So in general, um, those series of projects that I was very happy to work with Shannon in some of those studies, um, we're looking at meaningful noise in life as a way to see the relationship um, that can be explained when it comes to stress. And here's what we thought uh, is the uh, a model that was studied uh, under this series of studies uh, that was uh, investigated where we looked at, as, you know, at stressors such as conflict, uh, role conflict stressors, and um, overload, role overload, and role ambiguity, as, and how those stressors predict anxiety-related, um, work-related anxiety at work, and turnover intention. Uh, the beauty about it, and Maria told, told us so nice yesterday that the beauty about it is that only talking about role stressors doesn't seem to be enough. We have to understand how people understand the role stressors. It's not like you and me can understand. We can always think that's something bad uh, or there's something nice that you should grow out of it. What happens to be is that people interpret a specific role stressor as a something as a challenge, as I said, you know, I can overcome, or, oh no, this is a block in my road. There's something not so nice, that's a hindrance. So that seems to mediate the relationship. And um, in this mediation, when we look at the way people uh, 
understand the purpose of their life, why I'm here, that's meaningful lesson in life, seems to moderate, so give different uh, weights to this, to this relationship. Uh, meaningful lesson in life, as a matter of fact, seems to be a variable that we've been working more and more, uh, that I want to work even more with that. Uh, that's been uh, investigated quite well by uh, with Sharon and by her instru instrument. So we looked at uh, about 400 police officers for this study. Uh, here are the measures that we have, role stress scale, and uh, the Henderson Challenge evaluation, they are quite well known. I mean, uh, people who work with stress know those, those measures. So do, the, do we work uh, know about a very easy and small measure of anxiety and uh, another measure of intention to live. Wonderful, because they are short. I love short uh, instruments. I can't stand the long instruments, nor can participants. They get, you know, they get bored to death. So uh, it's wonderful when you have uh, small things, such as the Glazer Meaningful Lessing Life scale. Easy eight items. You just go ahead, ask people. They tell you how meaningful their life is, right? Or they understand their life to be. Here's what we found. Um, as you can see by the loadings, um, the mediation is there, clearly. Uh, let me translate something for you. I mean, when you see an I has to do with um, intention to leave or turn over. <coughs> when you see an A has to do with uh, anxiety at work. Uh, so that seems to uh, mediate the way people interpret uh, those stressors, mediates the, that relationship when, uh, with anxiety and, and turnover. And the meaningfulness in life is a clear um, um, moderator there. So what we're saying, that meaningfulness in life actually mitigates the um, negative consequences of role stressors. If people know what pur the purpose is of their life, what they are here for, uh, why they should go through this to, to do something. When people have this cognitive perception, this cognitive uh, uh, construct there, that seems to reduce the negative uh, effects of role stressors, as well as improve their work experience and their well-being in general. Uh, as I said this, we did that with one study, we did that with o on other studies, looking at other, uh, other dependent variable, variable of interest within the police. And finally, the last study I wanted to tell you, and then we go ahead and uh, I don't know how far I'm on time. Then I go ahead and um, draw the, 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 the conclusions that I wanted to have, and then uh, we can open for discussion. I'm eager to discuss this with the group pilots. And um, the last study within that category that I created, uh, we're talking about the COVID uh, prevention uh, act, if you will. Let me tell you how things were in Brazil. Each of us has a beautiful story. Or no, I don't want to say beautiful. I would say scary, actually, story to tell about the COVID, right? And um, yesterday, I was talking with some colleagues, some friends, and uh, they were telling me uh, what happened in Ireland, what happened in other countries. Uh, so anyway, each of us has a story about it. And um, what happened in Brazil? COVID came, and uh, as you might remember, some of you, we were in a government back then that um, were, was a, later became known as a negationist government, meaning, um, no, this is only a flu that actually the president said, this is a small flu, we should not care about it. So, I mean, these sort of things happening in the country, whereas COVID is spreading, right? So, um, we only have had the vaccine by May 21, 2021, other parts of the world already had the vaccine, other people have already been vaccinated, but there's only when the vaccine arrived in Brazil, <clears throat> and even so, uh, it arrived for priority groups only, people with uh, special 
diseases, uh, elderly folks, um, people who work with health. So that's especially for them, right? Understandably, of course. By January 22, uh, we had about 45% of police officers or security agents within the country that had received uh, the two shots of the vaccine. Five minutes. The two, uh, two shots of the vaccine. And uh, whereas by the same time, the general Brazilian population, uh, we had a, a percentage of 87% of uh, the population who had received at least one dose. And we were like, what is going on? I mean, these are the folks who are back who are on the streets, right? They didn't stop throughout co uh, the COVID infection. There was no lockdown for them. I mean, they were actually on the streets making sure the lockdown would happen, right? And they don't take the vaccine. I mean, I would be in the first in line, right? And uh, so I want you, what's happening here, right? And then uh, we were lucky enough to have a study, which is there, we've been reported there, where we looked at police officers, or rather public security agents in general, in the whole country. And uh, so we have 26 states in Brazil, that's as much as we reach. And um, we, do, we did a time lag procedure so we could be more comfortable. And uh, we look, also look at the records, official records, that they had for vaccination in Brazil back then. Uh, that's only for police officers, okay? So about 11% uh, of them had just one dose of the vaccine. Uh, half of them had two, two doses of the vaccine desire. Um, they built on each other, those percentages, right? And about 35% had two of those vaccinated, had uh, the two doses plus the, boost, the booster uh, shot, okay? And um, about half of them reported already having had the, the COVID. Uh, when you look at values and how does that relate, remember that we are talking about conservation, uh, self-transcendence, self, uh, self-enhancement. Here they are again. Conservation and uh, self-transcendence positively related to the reported, the official reported index of the vaccine. So people um, who got vaccinated, there was a quite a good relationship with people who endorse those specific values. Whereas a negative uh, relationship happened with uh, uh, openness to change, not uh, uh, significant for self-enhancement. But also with openness to change, it, it was significantly negative. So people who endorse the new, how, how interesting I thought. Exactly who those who, who endorse uh, like to think for themselves and like to act for themselves and think that stipulation and the new is a good thing for those who don't want to be vaccinated. So um, I have to move on quickly now. I was being told, what does that tell us? How uh, values seem to be important in that relationship when we work with police officers. I'm totally convinced of that. I'm totally convinced that uh, there might be a trend that I'm investigating there about conservation, self-transcendence, and openness to change, both positively and negatively, negatively with uh, the variables of interest that we're looking at. Uh, this has to do, I'm also quite comfortable with this, this has to do with the relationship of such values, especially self-transcendence, with aggression, uh, Maya, uh, who is also in the conference, uh, and Tammy, who is also in the conference and here somewhere, um, have been investigating the relationship with values and aggression with adolescents uh, and children for a little while. They have wonderful results on that. And it appears to be that with police officers, the, the, there's a field there to be built. In fact, uh, we tend to keep on working with that, with the conflicts now in Israel and the Brazil, looking at these relationships. So there seems to be uh, something for us to unveil and to work more. And um, good things about it 
is that when we talked about when we talk about training police officers training especially those training that have to do with reinforce social values we have some contribution to give to these institutions we have some contribution to give to police officers to reduce aggression rates within the police uh, that relate to, to police and uh, also to um, maybe uh, uh, understand the complex um, uh, mechanism that is behind that uh, aggression when it comes to the police. You know that we've seen horrible stories uh, with uh, police uh, officers actually killing people just you know for no reason whatsoever, or very poorly justified reasons, right? Maybe openness to change has, does justify uh, those police acts. When we talk about uh, uh, high stakes, a uh, very stressing situation, such as uh, you know, getting to, to see a, uh, uh, somebody who allegedly has committed a crime and how they react to that. You know? So maybe there's something there. Uh, we, uh, and the contribution that I think that we have to give to those folks is that they need to be aware of their own values. They need to know what's going on with their motivations. Uh, just one more slide and I'm done, I promise. Uh, meaningfulness in life, guys, seems to be a wonderful variable to interpret the uh, relationships that we find um, uh, when you are investigating the police. Well, the police work is, uh, is one that have to do with stress the whole time. They work with stress. That's what they do for their living. When something happens, when we, um, uh, somebody breaks in our house or in our place, when uh, your child gets lost, when there's a crime that happens, the first people to be called are the police. They are dealing with that the whole time. So uh, we, we need to understand how do they think the meaning of their life, how do they interpret their life in those, in those situations, these sort of situations. Uh, studying the meaningfulness and the stress, the, 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 the stressors, uh, that they, they have the whole time. Maybe it's a way to come up with better job designs and better work task distribution and task uh, uh, designs even uh, to give support to those folks, make uh, their work a more um, humane work, place, workplace to work. Um, trainings that deal with perspective training and self-awareness seems to be essential uh, for, for those folks to reframe the way they, they see the, the world or the events and the situation. I'm talking about develop meaningfulness in life there. And it is, seems to be essential that we have uh, some evidence-based uh, suggestions, evidence-based interventions to uh, suggest to the police is enough, we don't have time anymore to talk about things that I think could act, could happen. I need evidence for that. That's the only way we can uh, contribute to the police. Why? Let's point. Because authority, police has, I'm also convinced, the police has a police force around the world. They have a uh, organizational culture in which that so well established some uh, characteristics, some features of this uh, organizational culture. Being uh, is isolation, they uh, work in complete isolation when it comes to the population. Most countries, the police officers are not supported by the population, quite the opposite. Uh, therefore, they uh, rely on the other police officer to make a sense of their living, their solidarity. Uh, they work with danger the whole time, and, as I just said, an authority seems to be the key aspect of police officers. Uh, 
They're extremely proud of the authority they have. They're extremely proud of the type of work they do. Um, they're extremely proud as the uh, privilege that the society assigns to them. So we as, as uh, psychologists, not only social or IO psychologists, but we as, as psychologists must know their practice, must know the way they think, their principles, and um, the way they understand the world so that we can make a difference in the police uh, job around the world. It's not enough to say I don't like the fact that a police officer assaulted somebody and killed this person because this person was black or an immigrant, whatever. We need to do something about it. And the only way we should do something about it is understanding their beliefs and their values. So that's it. <laughs>